Hello again. Uh, we are back for the last part of the um, last session of our workshop. And uh, our next speaker is David Gao from Nanolayers Research Computing Limited. He will talk about multi-scale material modeling on nanotube-based devices. David? So as, as with many of the previous speakers, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to come out here and talk about my work in person. Um, I think traveling is probably one of the best parts of the job, and we've been without it for quite a few years, so it makes a huge difference. Actually, sometimes you don't even realize how much you miss it until you get back to it, right? Okay, so as, as introduced, my name is David Gao, and I am the CEO and founder of Nanolayers Research Computing. Uh, we are a materials modeling and machine learning company based in the United Kingdom. We also operate in Estonia and in the United States. So this, this project is really a new one for us. Uh, we've been working on it for about a year, and it represents a new collaboration between some old friends and new friends. So on the nanolayers side, we are working closely with Alex Schluger at UCL, uh, who we have a long-standing relationship with. And actually, all of us at nanolayers have worked at UCL at some point. Uh, we do the electronic structure and mesoscopic modeling for this project. Um, the Aerospace Corporation's team is led by our old friend Gennady Bazooker. Um, and he is working on the device modeling aspect of this work. And finally, we have Nantero, who are our new friends from this year. And they fund this research project uh, as an industrial research collaboration. So when I, when I first got the invitation uh, to give this talk, my first reaction was that I was going to speak about defects, I was going to speak about mechanisms, electric fields, you know, things like that. Um, but then I, I, I looked at the title and I realized that this workshop focuses a lot on taking materials to devices. And we had quite a good example of you know, almost a, a brand new effort into doing this. Uh, so what we would like to do is I'd like to talk to you about modeling carbon nanotube-based devices using a lot of the wisdom we've gained over the years in microelectronics and really trying to accelerate the device modeling of this particular class of devices. Right, so as a quick outline of my talk, I'll go over some motivation and some computational approach details. And then I've split it basically into three parts. So the first part will be how we model the atomic level structure of our systems. The second part will be how we calculate current through our systems and through carbon nanotube contacts or junctions. And then I'll put it all together and, and show you how we combine this information into a device model. So those of you familiar with Genestro will see that you know, there are a lot of parallels between what we're doing here and what we've traditionally done for microelectronics. Right, so in terms of motivation, um, this comes from Nantero, who are the leader in producing carbon nanotube-based uh, cells. So they're, they're NRAM cells, but also looking at neuromorphic devices, so very much um, within scope for this, this meeting. And what we have are carbon nanotube films. So these are amorphous films grown between two electrodes. Um, and we think that within these films, you can switch things between on and off states. And there, there is this hypothesis that when the nanotubes touch, you can have a current flowing between them. Uh, when, when somehow you manage to break that contact, you, you turn off that little piece of the material. And you can think of the material roughly as just a whole bunch of these connections strung from one end to the other in some pattern. So this, this is nice, but also really tricky to translate into the atomic level, because while we have results like uh, good TEM images of the slurry that's used to grow the nanotubes, and we have things like the density of the material, 
we know the length and the chirality of the nanotubes that we put in, there are no measurements of the grown film as such. That's, that's really hard to do. So our goal in this project was to, was to take this device as inspiration and develop a device model that goes all the way from the atomistic level of detail with electronic structure effects up through you know, calculating current through the materials, figuring out how all of these junctions work, proposing some mechanisms for set, reset, and switching, and incorporate them into what we like to call this minimum viable device model. So these, these materials are really complex, right? There's, there's nanotubes in them. Um, they're between two electrodes, but the nanotubes themselves can be single wall, they can be multi wall, they can be defective. We might have fragments of nanotubes from the deposition. You can have things like amorphous carbon, you can have silica getting in there. You can also have a material from the electrodes migrating in, uh, which, which you don't want. So everything you know, that we, we always think about in microelectronics can also happen here, but um, in this system, we're sort of not as far along, so we ignore a lot of these things in the first approximation. We really want to build a model of how it works at all in the first place, right? Right, so as I said, this is a collaboration between experiment and theory. Um, and Nantero has done a really good job of characterizing certain aspects of these devices. So we, we do know quite well things like the density, we know the dimensions of the switchable films, we know the radius of the nanotubes, we have length distributions of the nanotubes that go into the devices, and we, we work closely with them in order to build models of the material. Uh, in order to do this, we do multi-scale modeling. So we start from atomistic techniques and we go all the way up to mesoscopic and eventually phenomenological techniques uh, that end up in device models, right? So our, our rough scheme here is that we start by building mesoscopic structures in order to get a picture of what the material may look like at all and how the nanotubes connect to each other. Then we, we model you know, current, we put them into statistical models, verify things with experimental data, and we have a, a nice feedback loop because they are also very good at the fabrication part. So, you know, if we, we tell them we should fabricate these films in a certain way to avoid structural properties, they can do that. Okay, so very briefly, I think, we, our computational approach um, mainly is meant to simulate the structure of the entire device uh, as well as the conductivity of nanotube junctions. So con conductivity or the current that goes through them, they're more or less related, right? Uh, our device models are constructed using classical force fields, but, but a bit more coarse grained. So these are mesoscopic models. And we use DFTB and NEGF as implemented in the DFTB plus software package to calculate currents going through the junctions. So you'll, you'll see why we, we do that in a minute as well, uh, rather than sticking with regular DFT. So DFTB plus um, is, a, is an approximation of, of the DFTB, which makes things a bit faster. And we had a speaker talk about non-equilibrium Green's functions yesterday, so I won't go more into detail about that. Right, so the first challenge then we need to model our um, atomistic structure because all we know right now is that there's a 20 nanometer-ish thick film of carbon nanotubes. And you, you can kind of propose all sorts of different connection schemes and mechanisms you think are happening, but we don't have very much information there. And in order to look at this and to build this minimum viable device model, that includes the nanotubes at first, but none of these extra you know, defects, uh, impurities, or, or complexities, is to simulate the dynamics of the entire device. So we had a very nice talk just now about amorphous structures. Um, and these, these are amorphous structures as well, 
And as, as you just saw, characterizing amorphous structures is very hard. But we can characterize after we build them, right? So we use mesoscopic models, um, which lets us simulate things to the scale that we need. And within these, these uh, codes that we use, we can actually include effects such as electric field directly. So one, there, there are a number of tricks where you can, say, select individual nanotubes and calculate the amount of torque that one would be felt in an electric field based on its dipole moment. So these mesoscopic models can eventually uh, incorporate switching effects, which is really useful. Now, the, the reason we use them um, is, is really to reduce the number of atoms that we have in the simulation. So this is a schematic of the mesoscopic bead model. So each point is a particle in the simulation which can be expanded uh, as a cylinder. And it, it actually takes into account things like the corrugation of the potential along the surface. Just to give you a rough idea, I guess one single 100 nanometer nanotube has you know, on the order of tens of thousands of atoms. And that is just one nanotube in this complex film. So by doing this, we, we really cut it down by several, several orders of magnitude. Uh, these these uh, force fields, or the mesoscopic model, is parametrized to higher level simulations, and we, we benchmark them to our DFTB plus calculations, as well as to DFTB, DFT calculations in VASP and CP2K. So the point is, of course, to study the dynamics of these long nanotube systems, get structures, and then we try to map electronic structure properties from you know, higher level simulations onto these structures later on. Yeah, so the, the idea is to build up these types of films. So this is a side view, and this is a top view of a nanotube film. Right. Um, so when you typically make an amorphous structure, uh, a lot of the times you start from a crystalline structure, and then you melt and quench, because that's how we make glass, right? The nanotubes we found in this case do not really have the ability to reorient themselves so well if you start them in a crystal structure or in a high density structure. And they are actually deposited uh, from, from some spin deposition methods. So instead of starting from a crystalline structure, we actually just initialize a huge cell. And based on the density and the final dimensions of the device that we get from experiment, we know how many nanotubes should be in there. Yeah? So, so what we do is we, we cycle between applying a downward force and performing some molecular dynamic steps um, and equilibrating the film. We repeat these, and eventually you reach a desired density. And that, that's the density that matches experiment. So through, through this scheme, we can start to create you know, layers of carbon nanotube films with the density that they get experimentally. Right. So we, we've created quite a large library of these films. Um, experiments can show that they, they can fabricate devices using films composed of nanotubes anywhere from 10 to 100 nanometers. Um, and you can see in these images that, say, 15 nanometer films look wildly different from, from 100 nanometer films, especially when you consider that the film is only 20 nanometers thick so if you have nanotubes that are 100 nanometers long, they, they really uh, are, are quite, quite long. Um, and we, we also do mixtures, right? Because industrially, it's, it's very difficult to make sure you only use one length of nanotube. And you can also control some favorable properties by having a distribution of lengths. Right. So once, once we have this big library of nanotube films, um, we can also incorporate certain aspects of the deposition that can be used to tune the devices as well. So they, there are devices where the entire device is 20 nanometers thick, but it's really composed of four different deposition steps, each one five nanometers thick. 
So what we can do is we can take four or five nanometer layers, we can deposit them on top of each other, equilibrate, and eventually you get a final, a final structure that is built from four layers grown on top of each other, uh, rather than one massive layer that's been deposited all at once. And these, these structures are, are, of course, very different from the single layer nanotube films, uh, which is another structural parameter they can use to try and improve the devices. Okay, so we have this massive library of films. You know, we, we've got different lengths and distributions of nanotubes. We, we can account for how you deposit them. Um, and then suddenly you hit, you hit the problem where you're trying to discuss with the experimentalists and you don't actually know how to tell them whether or not your films are good because amorphous structures are hard enough to describe to begin with, right? You, you can try to use things like uh, radial distribution function, you can use bond length and angle distributions, you know, some rough coordination numbers. Uh, but when all your particles are, are huge tubes, uh, most of those concepts don't quite work. So we, we've tried to develop new ways of describing these films so that we can try to analyze the experimental results. Um, we, we can tell them, you know, essentially a, a new language in which we can describe the film structures to them at all. And the, the first major aspect is that when you have a bunch of nanotube films like this, they, they have really strong van der Waals interactions, so they like to sit parallel to each other and they, they bind quite strongly. And when you have a bunch of tubes doing that in a cluster, they, they're called bundles. And what we can do is we, we can algorithmically extract the composition of, of all the bundles within the system. So we've, we've written routines to convert these structures into uh, bundle distributions. And we, we can also look at the properties of the tubes within the bundle. So oftentimes, you know, one, one major hypothesis is that you have a bunch of shorter tubes bundled with the longer tube, and that single longer tube that sticks out is free to bend, and that might contribute to switching mechanisms. So this, this bundle data is really useful to push forward into the device models later on. Right, and when you, when you look at these, these films, there are a number of other aspects you can use to classify them as well. Um, another one is voids. So when you deposit uh, either a single or multi-layer films, sometimes you can see areas um, where, where you can actually see through the entire material to the other side, right? So this, this is a structure that's got a bunch of different colors representing each layer of nanotubes. And on the top view, you can see there's definitely regions where you can see through the entire material. So th this is really important um, because if you think about depositing your top electrode, then all of a sudden you might bridge the two electrodes with your electrode material, which is not great for making a device. So with, with all of our library of films, we can also try to control effects like this, yeah. Right, so the the other thing we can do within these, these films, rather than just analyze them structurally, is that we can start to identify um, how current might go through the film and come up with ideas of what the pathways look like and what mechanisms might be prevalent there. So it, we can't quite use the same models um, related to, say, tunneling from trap to trap, because the, the nanotubes you know, are actually quite, quite conductive themselves. So you basically have ballistic transport through, through the individual tubes. So what we do is we take our nanotube structure and we map it to a graph network. And then we, we build these connections based on all of the touching points between individual nanotubes, so junctions between nanotubes. And doing that, we can apply algorithms that tell us things like the you know, the, the lowest distance between the bottom and the top, or the, the shortest number of um, the fewest junctions. So sometimes you might have one tube that goes all the way to the top. Sometimes you might have to pass through 
10 nanotubes. And these, these we also push forward into our device models. So this, this idea here is really like the Google Maps version of our nanotube film, right? So when you go on Google Maps and you want to go to the conference dinner, it, it tells you what the shortest pathway is. But when we're able to put all of the, the conductivity, all of the current information into it, it becomes like Google Maps with traffic data. So you know, you know which pathway is actually the fastest and which, which ones will be you know, for your device operation. Right, so I, I hinted at already. Um, another really important thing to keep an eye on are these bridging carbon nanotubes. So I, I mentioned that the, the tube lengths can go from you know, 10 to 100 plus nanometers, and often the film thickness is only about 12 nanometers. So it's natural to think that sometimes you will have a tube that bridges the entire material. Um, and I think it's also pretty obvious that this, this sort of uh, contributes significantly, let's say, to the conductivity and basically short circuits the whole fabric. So within our structural models, we can keep an eye on these types of effects as well as things like voids and you know, what the pathways actually look like. And we can answer questions like, how, how do we deposit the nanotubes the films, either in layers or with different lengths nanotubes, or functionalizing them in order to prevent these effects from happening? OK. Um, and finally, we can look even closer at the pathways that we've extracted. So if we know which nanotubes you know, are, are mainly participating in transport mechanisms, we can trace the pathway all the way up, and we can see all of these switchable spots. So there, there are going to be a lot of nanotube junctions that are not realistically switchable, right? If you have 200 nanometer tubes that are just side by side, completely bonded, van der Waals interactions, you're not going to pull that apart easily by just applying an electric field. But if you have a, just a bendy tip of a nanotube touching another one, or one that is quite close to another tube but not quite there, these are the types of junctions that we can consider to be switching junctions. And this, this is also fed forward into our device models. OK, um, so now, now we know a little bit about what these materials look like. We know a little bit about how you know, electrons might travel through it and what types of junctions are important. So then the, the next step is to start looking at the electronic properties of, of these things. And what we do is we, we want to calculate current through these nanotube contacts so we can complete the picture about how uh, the devices function. So this schematic shows all of the possible nanotube contacts within the NRAM cells that we've identified from our structures. Uh, you basically have all of these uh, CNT bundles, and you have a number of types of contacts. So the first one is bundle-bundle contacts. So it's this one here, where you have one bundle touching another bundle, and it's, it's usually you know, one nanotube from a bundle touching another bundle or, or more. You, you also have intra-bundle transport. Um, so that, that's actually just transport in between nanotubes that are part of the same bundle, right? So they, they share a huge amount of overlap, and, and they can participate quite well in transport as well. And then we, we have two more that are the bottom electrode contact and the top electrode contact. Uh, so I, I won't be talking about these two much today, um, because we've, we've mainly accounted for this um, for now with a placeholder model based, based on what we know about microelectronics. We have not modeled the interface as such. OK, uh, so before we can look at junction currents, of course, we have to look at individual nanotubes, and we have to see whether our, me our methods uh, give you the resi right results. Yeah. So this is a 9-9 chirality nanotube. It's, it's kind of a prototypical system with periodic boundary conditions. And we're looking at it with uh, DFTB plus and, and this NEGF. So we've got con contact regions, red and yellow, and a blue device region. 
And basically, we, we can reproduce ballistic induction. We can calculate a current through it. We can look at the work function of the nanotube and compare these values to experimental ones and, and get quite good agreement. Uh, we also benchmark all of the structural stuff and uh, band structure with CP2K and VASP calculations to make sure we've got that all correct. Okay, <clears throat> so now that we, we're starting to look at tip junctions, we can start thinking about how tips you know, begin to touch each other, what types of interactions you may have. So that we, we come to the simplest tip junction, which is just formed when you put two nanotubes end to end. Um, and these, these junctions look, look like this. They're actually very weakly bound, because remember, all these nanotubes are, are hollow, essentially. Um, so you, you only have this ring of atoms that can see the other, other ring of atoms. The current between two tubes arranged like this is more or less dependent on the distance between carbon atoms. Um, and this, this can be made larger, uh, which reduces the, the conductivity even more when you functionalize the tubes. So a lot of the time, you might put something on the end here uh, for various reasons. One, one of them is to control the dipole moment of the nanotubes, which in theory could make them more responsive to electric field, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's a very simple type of junction, um, but pretty low conductivity. So maybe not, not so dominant in terms of transport. But then we have parallel junctions, which is another really easy one. It's just two nanotubes that sit parallel to each other, um, and they, they have some overlap area. So as the overlap area increases, as you might expect, the interaction energy increases. They, they're bound more and more strongly, and the current between the nanotubes increases as well. So this, this becomes kind of double-edged, right? Because the, the stronger you bind them together, the uh, harder it is to kind of break the connection if you want to try to switch them, but the more, more current you have running through the thing. Okay, and then, and then we have perpendicular junctions. So uh, we say perpendicular junctions, but they're not all perpendicular because you can have different angles of contact. And that's basically where you have one, one nanotube, say, going up and down, and one nanotube coming out of the screen. Yeah, so this contact area is quite constrained. It's, it's hard to get so many carbon atoms um, touching each other or in close proximity, no matter how you rotate it, uh, just, just because of spatial issues. But you might also notice, uh, if you're looking really closely, that these nanotubes are more distorted than the parallel junctions or, or the end-to-end -end junctions. And these, these distortions are actually quite important as well because they do have an impact on current, current and conductivity. So current through this junction is also controlled by, by separation, more or less, uh, but it's not quite so simple. So if we take all of these junction structures and we start minimizing their geometries, um, you can start them at any, any distance away from each other. So basically all of the orange ones here are these perpendicular junctions. Right, all of the blue dots here are tip-to-tip -tip junctions, so you notice they don't get that close to each other. And all of the green ones are these parallel junctions. Essentially, if you start the simulation close enough together, you just notice everything likes to be in this minimum van der Waals distance. And these, these dots can move up and down a little bit because the, the tubes are so big, there's so many atoms, the definition of distance between them is not so clear cut, especially when they start to distort. Yeah. But about, about three angstroms are just, just under. So all, all of these nanotubes mostly like to sit the same, same distance away from each other in all of these different types of junctions. But this is not the whole picture, since the size of the contact region is really small for tip-to-tip -tip junctions and perpendicular contacts. 
but it can be uh, much, much larger for parallel nanotubes. Okay, so then we, we can think about what different factors kind of have an effect, right, on, on junction current or on the current through nanotube junctions. And it's useful to just, just remember that it's, if you have two nanotubes parallel to each other, you, you have these ballistic channels around the edge of the nanotube, and then you have a tunneling region in between them. Um, and the first, the first aspect, of course, is the radius of the nanotube. So as the nanotube gets bigger and bigger, uh, we, we actually have reduced conductivity. So there's this uh, R squared dependence on the radius of the nanotube that you can fit. I, I've written role of chirality there, uh, which may not be totally accurate because you can actually have uh, different chirality nanotubes of the same radius. So it's, it's not completely straightforward to make that comparison. But essentially, we can approximate the current as depending on R squared. Right. Uh, and if you dig a bit more in the literature, you notice that previously some people have looked at things like this, and there should be a correlation to how much overlap area you have, right? Which, which is pretty intuitive. You have two nanotubes, the more they overlap, you know, the, the more conductivity you have. But when you look closely at the experimental data, there is a huge amount of noise. Um, and you can kind of fit a line to it, but there's actually a lot more going, going on here than, than initially meets the eye. Uh, and it, it turns out that you can think about this using the concept of atomic registry, which basically sums up how well the, the patterns on the nanotubes coincide with each other. So in these images, there are two sets of hexagons. So there's a red one and a blue one. In the first panel here, they're on top of each other. So you can only see the blue one. And the second one, you can see how the, the blue one is offset a bit from the red one. So you can imagine the nanotube containing the blue ones are, are out of the screen toward, towards you in the audience. And it's, it's basically rotated up by 20 degrees. And by, by symmetry, once you get to 40 degrees, you end up with the exact same structure as you had at zero degrees. Uh, what you can do is you can, you can look at the relative energies of these, of these configurations, and you see you know, it drops and then goes up as, as the atoms themselves coincide with each other. Um, but you can also calculate current through these junctions, and you, you notice that it doesn't quite coincide so well uh, with just carbon atom overlap, right? So there's, there's a slightly different profile, but overall a similar shape in, in the line for current, which is the red one, versus the, the line for uh, just energy, which is the blue one. Okay, um, so these, these are all interesting findings, but our goal really is to somehow map this information onto our mesoscopic model and to do it fast enough that we can, we can build a device model out of that, right? Uh, so total conductivity somehow depends on the radius of the nanotube, the separation between the nanotubes, the overlap length of the nanotubes, or, or area, I guess, um, any deformations due to the tube interactions, the specific atomic alignment of carbon atoms, which is this atomic registry uh, concept. And for really long contacts, when you have nanotubes that are you know, 50 nanometers long and completely overlapping, even the phase of the wave function has a little bit of an effect. Um, so we, we, can, we can continue to benchmark all our results a little bit more because some of these uh, nanotube junction conductivities have been looked at. Um, and we, we simulate a prototypical one and just, just do a voltage sweep all the way up. And we, we find that the contacts are basically ideal ohmic. So the black, black line is ideal ohmic. 
And we have that until about 0.8 volts. And then there's a rapid non-ohmic increase that goes up to the roof after this point. And this, interestingly enough, is, is uh, in line with experiment. So that, that's a really good sign that we've, we've done something right, at least. Right. So all of this information then, as I said, we want to condense into usable models, right? So I think most people here should be very familiar with WKB approximation. Uh, there was a paper that, that tried to model junction current using this, yeah? So it's, it's a very simple model. You just treat the barrier to tunneling as rectangular. You've got your region one, two, and three. Um, and it, it depends exponentially on separation between the two things you're trying to tunnel to and from. Uh, so yeah, similar in a lot of ways to our microelectronics models that are included in all these nice codes. The situation for nanotubes is a little bit weirder because the work function is quite sensitive to the deformation of the tubes. And as you saw, some junctions deform the tubes quite a lot as well. Um, so we, we can try to build um, conductivity models then out of all of this information. And the first one we have is a, a, what we call a small contact model. And this is basically based on the shortest carbon-carbon distance in the system. We can, we can have this equation, we fit, fit our results, and we come up with a model that's quite good for tip-to-tip -tip and for perpendicular nanotube junctions. But as you can see, for the parallel ones, it's, it's not so good. Uh, so as a result, the simple model doesn't work that well for bundled nanotubes, but it works well for junction contacts. The, the pro of this is that it's really simple and easily applied, and we can cascade it through our mesoscopic uh, structures very quickly. So the problem is, of course, we have a lot of large contact um, junctions as well, because we have a ton of bundling in many of these systems. So we, we've come up with a second model which tries to improve this description by treating every carbon-carbon distance in the system as its own conduction pathway, and, and you sum them all together. And this, this is basically a sum of all the WKB conduction problems uh, all, all together. The problem with this one, even though it, it's, it's much better for these parallel junctions, is that it requires knowledge of carbon positions, yeah? So if you, if you remember the mesoscopic model, the nanotubes are represented by points, which are then expanded into cylinders, which means you've lost the individual carbon positions, and somehow you need to algorithmically put them back um, before you can apply this one. Okay, so that was the second part. And we, we can now calculate current through all the types of contacts we see in the material. We actually know what types of contacts are in the material. And the idea is that we want to build a device model that, that is useful in, in starting to improve um, these NRAM cells. So working with Gennady at, at Aerospace, we've helped them build this uh, NRAM Pi code, which, which basically does cycling pulse and sweep simulations, which has a, a ton of plotting functions. And I think some, something like this should be very familiar to a lot of the audience, uh, because it, it is a, a device model after all. Um, essentially, we, we start by creating the device. And in order to do that, we, we take parameters from characterization, so we know the size of the nanotube films, you know, we, we know the density of them, we, we know what length tubes there are, we know the distribution of the tube lengths. So we take all that information, we, we set our boundary conditions, and then we look in our uh, library of films to pull out the mesoscopic model that corresponds to that structure. Right? And within those mesoscopic models, we can identify exactly the conductive pathways and the bundling statistics. Right? So we, we know how a current is traveling through the device. Then, um, of course, we identify the important junctions or the ones that we think are switchable 
and we can calculate current. Then we, then we just run it through this set, read, reset, read a cycle as many times as, as they want. Um, and we, we update the temperature during set and reset. And read is just uh, calculating the current through the device. So it's so pretty straightforward. Also, um, pretty pretty basic compared to a lot of the more advanced codes we've got now. But this this includes you know all of the mesoscopic data. It includes all of the um, junction current data and everything we've learned from both ab initio mesoscopic simulations as well as their characterization. Okay, so. Then, then, of course, you, you start running these simulations and you try to compare them to measurements. Yeah. Um, and you, you can see that there, there is a lot of OK agreement at, at times, but we're clearly missing a lot of the other important effects. And that, that's because we haven't been able to look at interfaces. We haven't yet been able to look at defects or, or other materials going into these devices, right? Um, but on the other hand, it does mean we have, we have made it to the point where we have this uh, minimum viable device model that has the pieces you need to just barely make it work as a device model. And now we can start adding in all of the interesting physics that, that, that we have been able to look at for you know, oxides for many years now. Yeah, so this, this project is quite interesting because we, we were doing materials to devices um, under a framework that's very similar to microelectronics work, but within a system where a lot of the things we rely on are missing, right? And we've, we've really had a lot of fun going from the beginning all the way to the end, kind of as, as quickly as, as possible. So we, we've managed to generate atomistic structures of the entire device, uh, then, then we've built these film, film libraries, extracted structural features, and developed a language in which to talk to them about these, these devices. Then we've built two different junction current models that can be mapped onto our structures and pushed everything into a, a device modeling that they can use to compare directly to measurements. Um, yeah, so I think that that is all I wanted to show today, so thank you for your attention. David, thank you very much. Um, you showed um, uh, the uh, modeling, uh, but I was wondering uh, what kind of uh, useful devices you can make with those uh, nanotubes. So, NRAM, I would say it's a kind of a nanotube but a random access memory. Yes. Okay. And that works like in a resistive RAM fashion, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, so uh, do you have something, some other devices in yeah, mind so the, that can build? So Gennady, um, if, you, if you go to his talk at IRPS, he will show you a lot more about the device level simulations. And he'll, he'll actually show a lot of work where he's been simulating um, neuromorphic aspects of this device, ensuring in which in which ways it can it can really help make better neuromorphic devices. So th those are the two main classes of device that we're looking at, right? The the resistant switching memories and and then neuromorphic. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Yeah, thank you. Great talk. Uh, I was wondering uh, about the. Um, the structures you get from uh, from the nanotube samples, uh, in the sense that they, they seem to be, you mentioned that they are, they are very much bundled, and I see that you have like patch of bundles in which all the nanotubes are very well aligned, yeah. not only in direction but also in, uh, let's say in the in the edge, in the edge they are all aligned, so you form like rectangles where all the nanotubes have the same length and they form a very close uh, uh, pocket. Uh, and uh, this is not really what you see when you look at 10 images of, of real samples. So uh, maybe that has to do with the way that you model the, uh, the, the bundling or the, the structures with these continuous models of, of, of the nanotubes <clears throat> as continuous rods. So maybe when you deposit them, 
uh, experimentally, you have uh, maybe defects or maybe you have even the corrugation of the energy that you show in one of the last slides that precludes the nanotubes from sliding and finding the, max, the minimum, minimum energy structure, which is fully aligned. So I wonder if you can comment on that, if you yeah, think so that I, your models are realistic or you're missing something. I think a, a big reason why tho those images I showed look like that is because they are using uh, uniform nanotube distributions, which they cannot have experimentally. Um, so I, I didn't put the images up because the, the uh, structures that have nanotube distributions for the length are much newer. But the moment you have shorter and longer nanotubes, it, it changes wildly, yeah, so you no longer have these kind of rectangular effects. On, on top of that, though, there are a lot of techniques that they use to kind of add disorder into the system. So you can put things in that maybe go in between the nanotubes and, and prevent them from being so kind of locally crystalline in, in that sense. Yeah, they look yeah. in the structure somehow. So. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I had another question about the structures again. So in, in the initial slides, so it seems that the nanotube say, can be quite flexible or they, a few of them have some bands, right? Uh, so the question is, do you include, let's say, flexibility in your model? And if so, how this affects the, the, the conductivity? Of the, of the nanotubes? Okay, yeah, that, that's a really good question. So in the mesoscopic structures, we have included flexibility in the model because it's, it's been parameterized into them. Um, so yeah, depending on how you deposit and how thick the layers are, sometimes they don't have room to bend, sometimes they do. Uh, so, so far, we have not included the effect of having, of, of transport through a bent nanotube. Um, ma mainly because all, all the ones through straight nanotubes are, are basically ballistic. So the, that, that was not uh, sort of high up on the list of priorities, but it is, it is actually something we're, we're looking at now. So soon, I hope, that will go in, into the model as well. Um, I didn't show, but there we, we have another descriptor that's related to how bent the nanotubes in the structure are. So we, we basically take all the beads, line them up, and calculate mean, mean errors away from a straight line going through the tube. And you, you can build the film so that most of them are quite straight as well. So those dramatically bent, you know, 90 degree tubes don't really happen in films that you want to be making. Because if they have room to do that, they probably have room to go all the way, yeah, <laughs> to the other end. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Uh, I just have a curiosity about the um, uh, longitudinal align. So the, the two nan uh, nanotubes align longitudinally, so tip to tip. Um, is there a reason why you didn't go like uh, to shorter initial distances? Uh, in, so aside from the fact that uh, probably uh, the interaction will, would be stronger than uh, with uh, like uh, parallel alignment or uh, 90 degrees uh, alignment. So, so do you mean uh, why we didn't start them at closer initially? Yeah. Uh, we, we did, they just pushed, ah, okay. pushed away, yeah. I mean, you, you have poly repulsion and you, you can't fuse carbon atoms together. So they, they, they'll just push away or come together to that, yeah, okay. that distance, yeah. So, okay. Let's thank the speaker again, David, thank you.